I don't agree uh, for those who says that uh, if Anwar Ibrahim try to woo the Malay voters, it will jeopardize the non-Malay voters. I don't agree with it I, because I think the non-Malay is smart enough to think that uh, they cannot stand on their own. So. And yes, we are still going to be talking about election, but uh, this time it will be a by-election Sungai Bakap in Penang. Oh God, another by-election. Another by-election. Like, like uh, I think since uh, Anwar Ibrahim took over the government. It's like every other month, another by-election yeah, in this campaign. Yeah, I think, uh, if not mistaken, eight, nine by-elections. So yeah, there's a lot, uh, even by any Prime Minister's standard. Uh, recently, and uh, the results, as everybody knows, uh, and Perikatan National retained the seat, which is also rightfully theirs. And this is also the trend for the other seven elect, uh, by-elections that I mentioned just now. So there's a trend here of maintaining status quo, but a lot of other people uh, overanalyzing it. Because yeah, they would say by-elections, certain, at certain point, a certain extent, yes, it's true. Maybe uh, certain, uh, because... In by-elections, I think uh, people would use this as an experiment where they want to show some protest to give a signal to the whoever that one wants. So that's why the voters turn out for uh, Perikatan, uh, Perikatan, uh, sorry, Pakatan Harapan was very, very low, alarming low for them. So I think this is a, could be read as a signal, but I think to overanalyze it and says that this is a rejection of um, the Madadi government and whatnot, you know, involving any national interest. It's, I think it's very, very overarching towards, you know, uh, saying something nonsense. Because this, yes, true, uh, if there's a signal to be sent, this would be perfect time for those who are, especially the non Malays voters in Sungai Bakap would use this platform opportunity to send a signal. But it's not a, it's not like Prikatan uh, National gain a lot, even more majority as well. Like it's just the why the huge gap between the votes that gained by PH and PN is due to the lack of uh, turns out by the uh, especially PH uh, supporters. PN pretty much steady. Yes, there's a lack of uh, well, I think one thousand, but that's uh, within the margin of error. But for PH, yes. So this is more of, uh, a wake up call in a way but not as much as some analyze and uh and, and political analysts would say that uh, oh the, anwar needs to see this and reflect on themselves do some soul searching or something like that no this is just by election yes they might be get some few things right and wrong but more than that i think it's it's nonsense what do you think yeah i mean when it comes to by elections there's this whole hoo-ha about how it'll change it Almost everything like this is cool. Hey, hello, Pakatan Harapan still holds a huge majority in the parliament, right? Correct. No amount of by elections is going to change that, even if you have one once a month, right? Mm -hmm. So the issue here is that when it comes to the by election, is that, like you said, it remains the status quo. If it has been historically a uh, past seat, right? It's going to back up then I think it will remain that way unless uh, there's a huge radical change within the demographic saying that hey, we, we something uh, this past leader has done something horrible that we cannot forgive for, then maybe it'll swing over. But uh, what kind of campaigning, usually the campaigning that you do in a by-election is not that uh, sophisticated or even that uh, huge in scale or you, you don't activate the full jantra when it comes to in most of the by-elections that are happening, especially when it's a seat that is kind of a foregone conclusion, right? If let's say I was a Pakatan Harapan uh, you know, party member, or whatever, like the component party is, I would say that. Okay, look, historically it's been a past senior seat. It would be very difficult to unseat it, right? Like, what would be different now? What is it that you can bring tangibly to the table as exactly. an opposition in that seat to say that and rest control over us and say that, okay, we're doing things differently? But I like what you mentioned when it comes to the idea of uh, protest votes because. The traditional uh, Pakatan Harapan supporters, uh, demographics there, um, did not turn up in the force that it was expected to. And I think that plays it safe when it comes to saying that it's a protest route. And I think fair enough, it is a fair thing, fair way to say that, okay, we are, you know, I wouldn't say uh, against the um, Madani government. If you are against the Madani government, you would vote 
straight away for the income for the for pass. Yeah. I think it's more just of a reminder to say that okay, things are not as great as we expected it to be. Uh, but this is in a way that just says uh, should showcase uh, disapproval, but not in a way that outright rejects the principles of or the administration of the Madani government. So that is how I, I would see it. Because uh, when you look at the past uh, by elections, the trend kind of um, we it tends to remain status quo. Sometimes you might see some upsets here and there, but most of the time it is quite expected. Uh, but anyone wants to go and overanalyze it. Oh, okay, uh, in the finer, minute details, it showcases that oh, that there's an innate nationalist spirit within uh, past that is spreading everywhere to <laughs> across Malaysia. Uh, if that was the case, then uh, then I think. God help us in the next general election. <laughs> I think also the biggest factor why we played into this narrative is because I think this is what Perikatan National wants it to be seen as because this is, they know they can 100% win this seat. So they're going to play down that role as like, oh, if you don't win this, it means that people are actually against you and it means it's a, another plus point for Perikatan National that we are good. Dude, you're just maintaining your, your own seat. Like, the same thing could be said in uh, uh, Kolo Kububaru that, oh, the AP already win there. It's because it's uh, the incumbent, it's the AP. So why are you saying this? Like, oh, if let's say pass won uh, KKB the other day, or Bersatu, sorry, Bersatu won KKB. Now that would be an upset, uh, an upset and worthy of a headline. But it didn't happen because we know, the AP know they will win. Whoever you put there, will win that seat, period. I think it's the same thing here for um, uh, Sungai Bakap as well. So uh, it is in the interest of uh, PAS that wants to play down that role and then they just like, hey, uh, let's uh, make it more than what we actually win. They don't gain, they just maintain. So nothing changes before or after the election. So that's one thing. The second thing is as well, like the... After post elections, uh, I think Rafizi says that even whoever uh, contested in uh, Sungai Bakap will win the election for pass. I think that's I agree with that. And uh, but Okian Ming says that uh, on certain extent, like he sort of like being sarcastic to Rafizi and says, "Okay, uh, just to be uh, clear to the viewers here, we are not on either side, so we are bipartisan. See, <laughs> we try to be stay on the line." But I'm going to call out uh, Ong Kian here as well. Like, I mean, I admire his, his for his intellect, but I think he might be wrong when he condemned uh, Rafizi say, saying that, uh, yes, wh whoever will win for pass, if the people who campaign are people like Rafizi, Nick Nazmi and whatnot. So this is some sort of like saying that these people are useless. I mean, these are the people that toppled the Barisan government in 2018 and again, in 2022, if they cannot do that, like, I mean, on their own merit, like, who are you to say something like, you know, well, she's not longer MP. So, the, the backfire from this is that I think people, like I said, read too much into it and make unnecessary comments on, on, on why PH lose the seat. Speaking of unnecessary comments, I think we. Should, I, I think we, uh, Miss Okian Ming, if you want to fight us, and we're more than happy to invite you as a guest here, yes. if you're listening to this. But in uh, any case, welcome. In any case, uh, I mean, you could kind of see the writings on the wall, right? Most seats would retain their traditional historical uh, position. Like I said, if it's a huge like change in the leadership that uh, shatters perception of the. Incumbent, uh, the constituents, right? Then you would see a, a huge shift to whatever, something like that. But uh, I think right now, when it comes to this, definitely going to be another by election in, in August, right? Yes. In, uh, I think, Kelantan, Terengganu. Uh, yeah. And so it kind of, it will stay r relatively the same. We saw in the five uh, state election back last year that uh, PAS and Versatu is able to command a huge swath of the Malay Muslim um, population in, in the, the North, right? So I think that's not going to change much, really, until you mobilize fully for a national election. So it's just more or less uh, business as usual, I think. And that will keep on going for the next, uh, for the next few months, running up to the next uh, general election. Uh, but then, 
what would be interesting to see is that uh, you can call it midterms at this point already. The hmm. Sabah hmm. state elections oh, next yeah. year, how that will shake things up. I know Sabah is very, very different from how uh, things work in, uh, in West Malaysia, but it would definitely showcase the priorities of how um, the unity government uh, would try to maintain its partnership with its uh, with its partners in uh, GRS and Sabah. But at the same time, how uh, Perikatan National will try to win back a lot of those that has went towards the unity government. Definitely there are some people who did support the GRS coalition but weren't happy with it working with the unity government and still kind of want to work with uh, Perikatan National. At the very least, Bersatu will definitely not not pass, I mean, pass in Sabah. Uh, who knows, maybe. Mm. Uh, we did have... Uh, appointed uh, assemblyman mm -hmm. from PAS. So uh, surprises abound with that. Uh, and, you know, they could ch uh, find a way to penetrate the, the, you know, using a new tactic or even refurbishing the tactics they've used in the last five state elections to influence the East Coast, which is right. more uh, closer to, uh, you know, in a way kind of the sensibilities uh, parallel, uh, parallel and overlap there. So it would see... Uh, Sabah, I would predict Sabah to be a testing ground for a lot of uh, the politicking that's taking place leading up to the national elections. Yes, and uh, I think it will be very interesting like how Perikatan National will uh, assert themselves in Sabah uh, next uh, state election because I, Bersatu, I, I don't know what's the status in Bersatu, whether it's still with the GRS or whatnot, they, will they go on their own? So these are the tactics uh, that I think Perkata National should consider because uh, to you know just maintain their relevance in Sabah, I think it's, it's worth of whatever that they're trying to do because uh, you don't want to lose Sabah as well. So you just it, be, it will become like GPS in Sarawak if uh, Amno starts uh, weakening, PKR doesn't get much traction, and Bersatu will, you know, I don't see a huge uh, potential in Sabah as well. So it will be another, uh, which is good. I think, in my opinion, as a Sabahan, I think it's a good thing. But in terms of uh, uh, national politics, that would be, a, I think, a bit detrimental to, uh, especially for the uh, uh, peninsula side. Because, you know, you, you, want, you want to have uh, your reach until Sabah and Sarawak, right? So... That's another thing. But more importantly, going back to Sungai Bakap, is that how this by-election will not be just a... And that is, people already stopped talking about uh, Sungai Bakap, all right? <laughs> uh, we, Won't stop us, though. They will, <laughs> we'll, we are probably the last one we got to talk about Sungai Bakap, and you will never hear a word of it uh, after this. But... Like you mentioned, there will be another by-election in August and maybe in, in, in October. So these elections, series of elections, will again and again show that to Madani government that uh, this is an opportunity for you to some sort of uh, 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 boost your uh, some, uh, uh, support for the people. Because in this series of by-elections, if Madani government can just take one, it will be a huge, because the first block, the first moving block is the huge one. And it will become a, a domino effect uh, towards until the uh, general election. So that's, I think, what Anwar wants. The best possible scenario for him, it's that. He will win one, uh, which is a change from uh, PN to PH. And it will drive them, the momentum will drive them up until the general election. I think that would be best case scenario for Anwar Ibrahim. But that will still remain to be seen. But we have this sixth election, which is, I think, will be um, highly uh, 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 have a tendency towards, towards PH. Yeah, I mean, uh, when it comes to if these uh, by-elections, like because Prasatu is going through kind of a rough time, whether or not the um, the M, some of the YBs they have to vacate the seats. I'm not too sure how that's uh, playing out right now, but let's say there is a you know, upcoming six by elections. It may be for, let's say, uh, the Prime Minister and, and being leader of Pakatan Harapan, uh, he would be prudent and very apt to use these. You, okay, the, it's a fog, maybe it could be a foregone conclusion that it could go swing back to Perikatan National, but so it could be used as 
a preliminary testing to see how are you able to, you know, how do you say convert these uh, voters that are quite strong with the support of PN over to PH? What kind of formulas are you able to use? What kind of buzzwords are you going to use that would attract them back? And I think these are ways that you can actually test it. I mean, he has Rafizi to be able to do all the number punching and all the data stuff. And I think he definitely has a lot of other experts that can actually assist with that. So this would be a great opportunity for Pakatan Harapan to actually test out how can they re-penetrate those areas that they are traditionally aren't the strongest. Because I, this has been has to be said for the longest time that a lot of the Pakatan Harapan, PKR, DAP, they've always struggled with uh, winning over the more rural areas. Rural seats and uh, seats that are mostly comprised of uh, conservative uh, Malay Muslims. So, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking for a lot of these seats, they kind of are uh, of that kind of uh, disposition. Uh, they can use that to test a lot of the new tactics, a lot of the strategies, uh, and how they would actually use that learning moving forward into the next uh, general election. So a lot of opportunities you know, to lose a, maybe a few things, or you know, things remain the same, but a lot of opportunities to learn uh, what is it that uh, your voters really want, the voters that are not agreeable to you or amicable to you. You need to go back on the ground and say that. This is because this is what Anwar is good at. He's very good at going on the ground, making his grandiose speeches, making you feel like you are part of the uh, the crowd as part of a whole dimension of being part of something larger. Or the marching band. Around. Yeah, marching band, really. He's really good at that. He could capitalize on that. Of course, he's very busy now. And I think in his age, he's not as uh, dynamic as he was before. But it's to see, you, you can test the grounds, you test the waters. And I think that would reap more dividends. And then at least you prepare yourself for those uh, upcoming uh, general elections. Or you could prepare yourself to, you know, when you come to assist, if, let's say, in the Sabah state election next year, if the unity government still wants to continue its cooperation with its GRS partners, that would be a great way to start learning on how to adapt to this newer landscape. Because let's be honest, it's a very different landscape now in terms of uh, Malaysia's politics compared to before. I don't agree uh, for those who says that uh, if Anwar Ibrahim tried to woo the Malay voters, it will jeopardize the non-Malay voters. I don't agree with it I, because I think the non-Malay is smart enough to think that uh, they cannot stand on their own. So that's number one. And sec But secondly, what this series of by-elections shows that uh, because since he took office, he starts going to uh, uh, Solat Jumaat uh, every week in different places so that they, he can get this extra exposure to all the uh, uh, to the to the racket, right? But I think he needs to change his approach, like this kind of approach, going to malls, uh, you know, visiting. Uh, yes, it has its place, but also the limitations because of this is twenty twenty four. They are more, I think, a different, more effective way for him to garner the Malay supports. So it shows that whatever he did up until today, it's not effective. I'm sure it's working, but if one or plus one percent for him, so it's it's indifference for him. So if he wants to see something uh, marginal in terms of positive support. He should be, yes, keep doing that. Keep wooing Malay voters, but in a different way. What are those different ways? I, I, I cannot answer. You might want, Anwar Ibrahim, if you're listening to this, you might want to ask Rafizi again. What are the ways? Even if he knows that. But maybe you want to ask Zahid, right? These are the Panglima, Mala Panglima uh, Melayu, Ketuanan Melayu, that I'm sure they know how to woo their own uh, market, uh, uh, rakyat here. So for Anwar Ibrahim... Yes, there's a there's a place for his approach, but it I think it's outdated and no longer effective. He needs to I don't know if he needs to dance in front of TikTok, do it. If that's <laughs> it can go, go. I think my TikTok feed is better if I don't have to see that, <laughs> any of that. Maybe okay, maybe not maybe dancing not. in front of uh, TikTok. <laughs> Just you know, uh, do something else that uh, can go deeper, especially the youth. Uh, Undi 18 happened uh, last election and it will be become more in the next election. There will be more 18 years old in the next three years. So go for them, go after them and see 
where you can do this because at the moment as we see it pn is winning on that battleground and uh, as much as you are comfortable as a government with huge majority it it won't stay that way if ph is being complacent in terms of who will be coming into the electoral in the next few years yeah, before I mean, we wrap up yeah i mean when it comes to when it comes to Anwar Ibrahim's messaging rep, like you said that, oh, he goes to the mosque, that's, but it's kind of expected already for a lot of uh, Muslim uh, politicians, right? But I think one important thing is, you know, is, is these four words, keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> he needs to find a way to simplify the message, really. A lot of the times, it's very high level, very big, very big words. Who the hell cares on the ground, you know? Mm -hmm. Like competitiveness, okay? Yeah, maybe people in the city would understand that or, you know, ringgit, you know. The, That's for Bangsar Bubble. The, yeah. the nuances of the ringgit, yeah, sure. Great for people who are in the city, who are in the urban and in the know, right? But regular people on the ground, that's busy trying to figure out, okay, where can they get their daily bread? Where can they get their, you know, the the scrap, you know, the bread and butter issues, really. It's at the end of the day, no matter, like people would like to say, the ref especially reformists, they say, oh, okay, we need to think beyond bread and butter issues. But most of the voter demographic is concerned about bread and butter issues. And that seems to be where Anwar would have to start penetrating when it comes to his selecting his battlefield. And like you said, Amno has been doing this for a long, long time. They're very experienced already. They know what the people on the ground really want. So leverage more into that instead of talking about the subsidy ra rationalization, right? In parliament, okay, you think the average guy, uh, you know, in the kampung watching television or listening to radio, hearing that, actually wouldn't cares about that? I, I most of the time I still don't, right? No. And you are definitely, are, we only have a passing interest into it. So it's trying to simplify the message. Okay, how can your policies really, like, at the end of the day, at the end, uh, delivery benefit? Uh, people like uh, people on the ground. So that is one thing I think when it comes to the prime minister's approach uh, when it comes to trying to win back um, the conservative voters. So I think that's it for Sungai Bakap episode. If you have your own opinion or disagree with me or Adi, please put down uh, your comment below. And next up, we will be talking about, we're going abroad again uh, to our neighbor, which is Indonesia. So stay for, tuned for Indonesia. Yeah, we'll see. You know, the former colonizers are excited for yep. their football, uh, maybe victory. Who knows? Tonight. So see you there.